Norman. Never heard of it. I would say so play flats and this kind of thing. Yes, after having seen it on the television recently. Um, Brigham Young, the, the Trekkers, uh, George Utah, is that right? Uh, Salt Lake City. I don't even know what it means, Mormon. American Church. Mormon? No idea. Think of me. What, the religious group? Mormon, you mean the religious group? Oh, uh, what I've read about, they seem very good people, the Mormons. As far as I remember, it's a, a rather polygamous religion in the United States. I believe that in this country, people misunderstand them enormously. Extremist sort of organisation. I don't quite. I, don't, I can't remember what it is that they're known yeah. for. They do believe in a god, but I don't know exactly what kind of god they do believe. <clears throat> Mormon. Well, uh, they're famous for plural marriages in, in the in the U.S. Uh, I can't think of any Mormons being in Europe. American, extremist, misunderstood. A few of the labels popularly tagged to this remarkable religion, which is probably Britain's fastest growing faith. Why are thousands of British people of all ages embracing a foreign religion? and with it a whole new way of life. The Mormons' ability to combine religious faith with a practical lifestyle, especially their passionate attachment to the ideal of family life, seems to have special appeal for the British. From a toehold in northwest England in the 1830s, the religion has spread to every corner of Britain. They now number well over 100,000, with another 4,000 converts joining every year. Rhodes Boyson, Member of Parliament for Wembley, is well informed on the subject of Mormon history. And I trust abroad as well. I come from the northwest, from the Lancashire Hills, from which so many of the early Mormon settlers came. Indeed, I believe the Church of Preston preceded the formation of the Salt Lake City, or the beginning of the settlement of Salt Lake City, by something like 10 years. And indeed, I believe on one occasion, 5,000 were baptized in the River Ribble, something like 10 miles from my home. And that also, it was from those hills that so many of the early Mormons came who fired the early church from the nonconformist churches of the Northwest. In fact, Britain was to prove the most fertile recruiting ground for the new Mormon missionaries from America. Spurred by a yearning for religious freedom and by the economic realities of Victorian England, tens of thousands of early Mormon converts sailed from Liverpool and other ports to bolster the fledgling church in America. It was already struggling westwards to escape persecution in one of the most carefully orchestrated mass migrations in history. Charles Dickens was one of the first to comment on what he called the special Mormon aptitude for organization. I have seen immigrant ships before but these people are so strikingly different. Nobody is in a mill temper. Nobody is the worse for drink or uses a coarse word. Nobody appears depressed. They came from various parts of England in small parties that had never seen one another before. Yet they had not been a couple of hours on board when they established their own police, made their own regulations, and set their own watches at all the hatchways. I should have said that they were, in their degree, the pick and flower of England. Before nine o'clock, the ship was as orderly and quiet as a man of war. Even today, most Mormons in the Salt Lake Valley trace their ancestry back to Britain. But not all were willing to tear themselves away from their homeland to trek across a barren wilderness. Those that stayed formed Mormon communities in various parts of Britain, often with open hostility from neighbors. Sometimes, baptisms had to be performed secretly and at night, as at this spot near Merthyr Tydfil, South Wales. What was it about these people that aroused so much unfriendliness? Possibly the idea that it was an American intrusion, or perhaps simply because it was different. Mormons believed that the church established by Christ had been corrupted over the centuries. What was left was a semblance of religion only, a kind of ritual which had lost its real significance. They claimed that through a series of dramatic revelations in the 1820s to a young farm boy named Joseph Smith, the original church was restored as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, proper name for the Mormons. 
Today, the British church is run entirely by British people, but there's still frequent contact with the world president of the church and other leaders. It comes as vaguely surprising today to find Mormons in just about every conceivable walk of life. They say that being religious doesn't mean being dull. In fact, with the backing of a religion which teaches them to succeed in any walk of life, Mormons seem to fit comfortably into the worlds of sport, business, industry, science, medicine, the arts and politics. Three Mormons in two years have been elected mayors in Britain. The idea of personal growth and character development through self-control is central to Mormon thinking. Mormon youngsters are taught that by adherence to the teachings of Christ, they can control their own environment rather than be molded by it. They're taught that they came into this world to learn, to serve God and serve their neighbors. It's a formula which Mormons say enables them to mix easily in any group or profession. Dr. Nkere Uem has been a doctor for 17 years and a Mormon for 11 of them. And during those 11 years, I've never experienced any conflict between my profession and my faith. Indeed, the Christian, the medical profession is an op opportunity to practice one of the main teachings of the Christ, that is compassion to one's fellow man. Gordon Bates, canon at Liverpool Cathedral and a radio journalist, has met and interviewed senior Mormon leaders. What does he see as the main differences, then, between the Mormons and the established church? The Mormon church is that the Mormons would claim that the original church of Jesus Christ ceased to exist at some point after the death of Christ, and perhaps after the death of the first apostles, and that later on it was re-revealed or revitalized uh, at a later stage in history. Uh, this, of course, the mainstream churches would dispute because we would see that the, the Christian faith has been a continuing and a developing thing right the way throughout the years of, of Christian history, right down the centuries. There may have been developments, there may have been changes, but these have been spirit-led and spirit-guided. Whilst the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, would certainly say that they themselves hold the, the true revelation of what the Church of Jesus Christ really is like, really was like, and ought to be like all the time. But there is the difference that the Mormon Church would see the Bible as just one form of scripture, and that this is just one part of scripture, and the Book of the Mormons and their, their other rather important books are in equal importance. To the, to the rest of the Christian gospel. Here, of course, again, the mainstream churches would most certainly say this is not on, because, in fact, the, uh, the Bible for mainstream Christian churches is the Bible, and there is nothing to compare with it in any form or other. So this, again, is one of the big differences that uh, we would certainly see. And yet, in a sense, there's truth here, because I think one of the things the, the mainstream Christian churches have lost, or not lost entirely, but certainly not really given enough weight to, is that the Spirit of God is a continuing thing, and that many of the great books written by Christians since the Bible was put together, finally, have um, as much um, spiritual guidance as um, some of the books in the Bible. Let's not only dwell on the things that separate the sort of mainstream Christian churches from the Mormons. Let's also think about the things that certainly unite us. And one of the things which I admire, certainly, about the Mormon church is their belief that Jesus Christ is the Savior and that people really come to belief um, through the acceptance of, of Christ, through baptism for the remission of sins and through the laying on of hands. All these things... Um, the, the other Christian churches would certainly be able to accept and say, yes, in this sense, we, we are certainly at one with uh, the Mormon church. So here again are similarities. The belief that Jesus, the Son of God, came down from heaven, was born of the Virgin Mary. Again, yes, these are things that the mainstream Christian churches could accept. Where again we would differ, of course, is that we would dispute the idea that man is created in the physical image of God. We wouldn't want to say that God is physical or that Jesus is physical in heaven. Um, we believe God is a spirit um, and Christ in heaven is, is a spirit. Um, and we wouldn't perhaps say that the idea of God or, or, or the Son being flesh and blood are certainly things that um, we would want to dispute. But here again, you see so many people within the established Christian churches would dispute with one another over this kind of thing. Certainly one of the things which attracts me very much as far as the Mormon church is concerned is, is, is the Mormon church's 
a real commitment to the family, which, which again we would see as being part of the great Christian tradition. And the whole concept of tithing, you know, that a Mormon family will give one-tenth of their income um, to the Mormon church. I wish we could have that same kind of thing um, within the, the, the mainline Christian churches. We try to teach it, um, but perhaps because we have so many nominal members rather than deeply committed members, uh, this is something which we are, are not able to do. And certainly this is something I, I would like to see. The Mormon Church is also very much involved in social work, welfare work, the care of the elderly, the aged and the sick, um, the whole concept of um, aid to the developing countries and so on. This is a way in which the, the, the churches could so easily join together and really serve with each other rather than always sort of competing with each other. Morning. Here's your miracle wheels. Oh, lovely. There we go. Oh, I'm looking for, I've got quite an appetite. There's your paper I've brought in for you. Yes. How's your balance today? Not too good. Not too good. You're still a little bit off balance, are you? Off balance, a little well, bit off balance. You want to watch it and make sure you keep your walker. Oh, yes. You don't want you falling over and hurting yourself. No, no. But you enjoy that meal. Oh, I will. And we'll see you again next week now. That's right. Okay? Well, I look forward to you coming in. Fine. Next bye bye now. Morning. Bye. Fine. Bye bye now. But the Mormon idea of care for the needy goes much deeper than handouts. At an early age, Mormons are taught to value independence, hard work, and self-sufficiency. A Mormon who is unemployed is discouraged from joining the dole queue. Where Mormons are numerous, they've developed their own farms, canneries, and even factories to provide work opportunities for the unemployed. Most of the time, Mormon welfare projects are run entirely by voluntary labor. Children, parents, and grandparents all join in. Worldwide, Mormons donate three million man-hours a year to these projects, generating more than 10 million pounds for needy Mormons and non-Mormons. Although welfare projects in Britain are still in the early stages of development, plans for several ambitious farming projects are at an advanced stage. To ensure that families in need of any kind of help don't go unnoticed, the Mormons arrange for monthly home visits. Women are assigned in pairs to visit perhaps five or six mothers in their area and to help out where it's needed. If they encounter major problems they can't cope with, they call on the resources of the church. Similarly, fathers are assigned other regular visits, often paired with their sons. The system not only keeps local church leaders in constant touch with families, but aims specifically at building closer relationships between fathers and sons. But it's for home visits of another kind that Mormons are probably best known. Um, the Mormon church has concentrated very much on, on, on evangelism uh, and not worrying which, um, which people they went to. They knock on the doors of people who are very much mixed up with their own Christian churches and, and try to proselytize in that way. My admiration for, for the Mormon church is the way in which young men and young women give up 18 to 30 months of their time to do missionary work on, on, on the knocker, as it were. Um, would it be that so many of our lay people will be willing to give this time, this kind of time, this kind of work um, to the spreading of the gospel. This was very much the way of the, of the early Christians. This was very much the way of the apostles. And in most mainline churches now, we're beginning to realize that unless the church is willing to go out and to meet people through house groups, through cell groups and so on, and go on the knocker and say, can we really talk to you about the faith that is in us? Um, then we're not gonna cut very much ice. Uh, and particularly as far as the established Church of England is concerned, um, one must begin to learn again that simply being the established church it is not going to win as many converts. It's going to be by people in England going out to doors in England and really talking about their faith. And I think, again, one of the things which I, I'm beginning to see in the Mormon church is that the people who knock on my doors now are not the sort of fast-moving, smooth Americans. Uh, they are English young men and young women. Uh, and this, again, is something which the mainstream churches ought to begin to... to, to look at and say, this is something we must do. It's been suggested that one of the reasons the Mormons are so successful in involving new members is that the church is run by the members. When these men are not digging tin out of Cornish mines, they're providing spiritual leadership for hundreds of Mormons. My meeting starts, first meeting starts at quarter to seven in the morning. I'm involved from then right up till probably nine o'clock at night. 
And in that time, I presided over a bishopric meeting, uh, an executive meeting, uh, in attendance at uh, Sunday school, uh, continually interviewing people. The church has no paid ministry. A bishop could be a brain surgeon or a car body repair man like Peter Watson at Southport. My job is to work on uh, repair work on motor car bodies. Uh, I work as a bishop in my spare time. And one of the great things that is altering in the Anglican Church at the moment is that um, we are beginning to realise that on an economic line we can't continue with a, a full-time paid minister as being the only form of ministry. It's a return to the early scriptures, it's a return to the fact that Paul was a tent maker, earned his own living. My talk this afternoon is about seminary. I just the immersion in the religion is so total that a big congregation may have more than a hundred people holding some kind of office. Most members, including children, speak from the pulpit. The is to learn from the experience as well as to teach. I'm going to talk to you on fasting. Events as commonplace as a visit to the zoo are turned to advantage in the lifelong emphasis on education. For Mormons, learning is a commandment and the focal point is the family. The church places enormous emphasis on the role of parents in teaching their children. Parents are encouraged to teach by example in the home and by looking for teaching moments in everyday events. The church, schools and the community all play their part, but in the Mormon view, the home environment is the most influential in moulding a child's life. Mormons learn that no success can compensate for failure in the home, and the principle is repeated almost to the point of holy writ. Although not a Mormon himself, Lord Thompson has been a close observer of the Mormon educational system and the values it stresses. How does he see the Mormon approach to education and its relevance to family life? A high moral approach. Uh, with a special, special dedication to uh, 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 self-improvement, uh, to hard personal endeavor, and uh, frankly, lofty objectives. They aim high in anything they seem to wish to do. Uh, furthermore, I understand from my simple analysis uh, of the situation that the Mormon people place a tremendous amount of uh, importance upon family life. And I think one of the, uh, the most beneficial things they can do for, to, for their children is to confer upon them the tools with which to be happy and successful in their lives. And I think they feel that education plays a very important role in that future for their children. I myself was, I'm a Cambridge man, uh, and I have the greatest res of respect for English education at Cambridge and Oxford are tops, of course, in their way. But I would say that Brigham Young University is, in its way, uh, almost unique in the world. Uh, I would rate it uh, as one of the finest universities I've ever been associated with. According to Mormon scripture, the glory of God is intelligence. The educational process then continues into adulthood. Instructional classes of one kind or another for men, women, teenagers and young children are in progress at Mormon chapels on several days or evenings each week. The lessons may have a spiritual emphasis or may concern family relationships, physical fitness, drama or dance, or even administrative techniques. Women may be involved in lessons on nutrition, mother education, cultural refinement, or social relations. You know, it's, it's, it's a... But with all the stress on family life, personal development, and high standards in day-to-day -day living, why do some people at least hesitate in accepting members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as fellow Christians? Whether the Mormons are accepted as Christians in this country, I think is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think those of us who know Mormons um, and know them personally, Yes, then I think there is, is much that we could say is Christian about them. But I think the main trouble is that the vast majority of people uh, in this country, in the established churches, don't know many Mormons. Uh, I've never read about Mormonism in books written by Mormons. The only books they pick up are, are, are tracts against Mormons written by the established churches. And I think this is a great pity. If, in fact, they are to meet Mormons and to talk with them about the things they have in common with them, uh, then I think more and more um, Christians in this country will begin to accept Mormons as fellow Christians. But on the other hand, I think it's equally important um, that members of the Mormon church begin to meet other sort of Christians from other denominations and begin to see them as Christians too. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this food and we ask you to bless it in the name of Jesus Christ. The Mormon's strong emphasis on family life is becoming one of their most recognisable tenets. 
But why is it that some, when they think of Mormons, still think of polygamy? Well, polygamy is, is a fascinating subject. Everybody uh, is interested to hear about and read about polygamy. Uh, the idea of a man having more than one wife is, uh, is something that is, somehow captures the imagination of people in general. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't unfortunate at the, at the time. I understand the Mormon people did embrace polygamy in the last century. I understand they had very good reasons of their own for doing so. But they, uh, they forsook it in the last century, but I'm afraid it wasn't easy for them to forsake the, uh, the reputation. And uh, if there was one polygamist in the United States or anywhere else in the world, and he was a non-Mormon, you'd probably hear about him. But if he was a Mormon, for sure you'd hear about him. For British Mormons, the supreme expression of their attachment to the family concept is found in 32 acres of green Surrey countryside. It's at the Mormon temple that a husband and wife, already married by civil law, go through a second marriage ceremony to seal them for eternity. Children are sealed to parents, parents to grandparents. For Mormons, heaven is a family affair. Tony Camlin says that when you're expecting to live with your family through eternity, you take a good deal more trouble over them on earth. Before I was a member of the church, we, my wife and I, often discussed the fact that it seemed uh, a great pity that our marriage should end at death. And we were given the opportunity to go to the temple. We were able to go and be sealed, and we still do visit it. We have the opportunity of having our grandparents and those that have passed on before us sealed to us. It's the idea that generations can be linked together for eternity that has led the Mormons to their passion for genealogy and the world's biggest collection of genealogical records. Mormons say that having a clear idea of what life after death is like takes a lot of fear out of the thought of death itself. Bob Bruce is a Dover policeman and volunteer lifeboatman. His father, also a Mormon, is skipper of one of the cross-channel car ferries. I know I'm risking my life at various times, but this risk, if anything does happen to me, I'm in a family commitment with the temple marriage, and I know that I'll be reunited with my family, my wife and children. I believe the end of my life will be the start of something new. From 1837, when the first British Mormons were baptized in the River Ripple, to the 1950s, membership of the church fluctuated as the flow of emigrants continued between Europe and Salt Lake City. But when the church officially discouraged emigration, British membership took off. From 10,000 in 1957, the membership had passed 100,000 20 years later. The Mormons are now opening a new chapel somewhere in Britain every eight weeks. Characteristically, families usually help build them. While the focal point of Mormon buildings is the chapel itself, reserved primarily as a place of Sunday worship, the design of most buildings hints at the Mormons' all-embracing attitude to their faith. They include classrooms, offices, areas for drama, the arts, sports, and dance. It's strange. People think just because we don't drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes, we can't have fun. This is not true. We really do enjoy ourselves. We love to dance, to sing, and to meet together because of the greater insight and understanding that the church gives to me, I don't need those drugs or those stimulants in order to face the realities of uh, human relationships. You really enjoy yourselves and you find yourself doing things which you never used to think well before I became a member that, oh, I'd never, you'd never get me doing anything like that, I wouldn't dare. But um, once you get to know each other, there's no embarrassment. And from the very start, you, got, you start being able to teach you how to cook, to sew, they teach you how to dance, they teach you how to, to play act. They do all this, they teach you how to play sports, and how to get on with each other. I'm 16 and I'm the only member in my family and uh, my parents are, are glad that I did join because it does keep me off the streets and uh, I don't get into a lot of trouble and uh, they know that I'm with um, a lot of people who care about me and to take care of me. I was invited to a baptism, and I was at the baptism, and, um, you know, the things we were talking about, I didn't understand, but I got this feeling that I wanted to clap, you know, I was so excited. Since this world is so full of promiscuity, pornography, we feel that we have a great responsibility to teach our children the moral principles, and one of our leaders did say on one occasion that we teach them true principles, and they govern themselves, and taking this particular principle to heart, we feel that if we basically teach our children 
the way that they should go in life, there will come a time when they're alone and on their own, and because of that, because of the teachings that they've had in their early youth, they will remember them. In 1846, during his trek west to the Salt Lake Valley, an Englishman named William Clayton wrote a song which has become a favorite for the Latter-day Saints. The final words of each verse hint at the present and typify the Mormon's optimism about their future. All is well. <laughs> 